been there before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you and welcome and welcome to anybody who's online signing in. You may notice we have a smaller crowd today. That's because a lot of the ladies are gone on their women's retreat right now. And that that's where a lot of our people have been. But I got a few announcements I just want to draw to your attention. Um, there is a women's Bible study. It ha has started. It's starting tomorrow, Monday, at, um, on the 9th at 6 p.m. in the church office. It's just right over there. All ladies are welcome to come to that. Awanas is starting September 17th, and they need volunteers. So just be aware that if you feel the Lord leading you to go volunteer for Awanas, you can talk to Dale back there. <laughs> He, he's, he's the guy to talk to about that if you want to volunteer. Also, the temple Bible study, it's on hold for now. No? Okay, starts Thursday. This is just a typo on the back of my... So, starts Thursday at the temple's house around... And then it starts... Okay, so show up at their house around 6. You'll get some good fellowship time, some good food, and then that afterwards that'll lead on into uh, Bible study. And just to let you know, I have texted this out to the group uh, that normally comes to my Bible study that's on Tuesday. I am postponing it this Tuesday, just so you're aware. Um, we're not going to have that on Tuesday. I was invited to go do some things that I, I really want to go do. <laughs> oh, I'm going. I'm going to go to see a rodeo. <laughs> so I'm postponing that for this week, and then we'll we'll definitely be having it the week after. Um, but just so you're aware of that, and I tried to text everybody that normally comes to the the Bible study so that everybody who's not here, all the ladies and stuff, will be able to know. Is there anything I may be potentially missing? Nope. All right. Will you please stand with me and we'll open with the word of prayer. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, on the 14th, our church is responsible for serving the senior meals. Um, it, be at the... Se about 1045 to be able to help out with that, it, it normally takes about an hour, hour of service, and it's, it's not very difficult, but just so you're aware, that's going to be on the 14th at 1045. All right, let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great opportunity just to gather, to, to come and worship you, Father. We just praise your name and thank you for everything you have provided for us. You are a faithful Father, and we acknowledge that, and we just praise you for that. Father, I just ask that you would be here with us, that you would open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to your leading. Please draw us closer to you in relationship. Draw us closer to you in our understanding of your word and how to apply it to our lives. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Psalm 126, 3 says, let's all say it together. The Lord, the Lord has, has done, done great things, things for, for us, us, and we, we are, are filled, filled with, with joy. joy.
Five, three says, Great, great is, is the Lord, Lord and, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy Thirty-nine, seventeen. please read it with me. How, How precious, precious also are your thoughts, thoughts to me, O God. God. How, How great, great is the sum of them. them. Okay, children's story. Will all the children come up and sit on these first two rows? <laughs> or maybe the front row. You want to come up? Maybe, maybe you might want to come up with Grandma. There we go. Now we got the kids. There we go. We, we've got our kids together. I was just just noticing 
how cute and special you are. A little bit shy. But you know, we got a verse in the Bible that says, whatsoever you do, do heartily unto the Lord. In other words, whatever you do, you do to try to please God. Now, how would you please God? You know how, at your age, you can really please God? You can pay attention to your grandparents and try to please your grandparents. And that will teach you how to please God. Now, you've got beautiful hair all fixed up with that nice, what do you call this on your head? I don't know what it's called, but it looks so good. You know, you had to cooperate with your grandparents to get all fixed up to look so nice. Now, up on the screen behind me, you want to see the picture? There are someone working hard, doing everything to their work just to please God. They, I mean, they want to do it the way God wants. And then we look at the next slide and see what happens <laughs> when they please God. See those big smiles? Even your schoolwork, which is coming up quicker than you want to believe, you're going to have a chance to please God. Now, you're going to want to have lots of friends. You want to know a way to do it? A person that has friends has to be friendly. You know, and you can be friendly to the other kids, and you can have friends. Now, you're, you're uh, getting to be a big girl, so this time you get to go back and sit with your grandparents. So, thanks for coming up and letting me talk to you. Okay. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. here. In uh, Leviticus, chapter, it is the burnt offerings because of the burning upon the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garments, and his linen breeches shall be put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offerings on the altar, and it shall be put them beside the altar. Fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on every morning, and lay the burnt offerings in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall never be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out. Okay. Long to be with Jesus. Just think of our sins as ashes that must be removed so that we are pure in heart before God. In 
Romans 12:1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And Acts 2, 3, that was at the, that was at the day of Pentecost, okay? And over here in Matthew, Chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize, baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John speaking. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost and with fire wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chap, which is unquenchable fire. Okay. And I go over here to... Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. <clears throat> Where am I at? No, it should be chapter. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not, not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things and many physicians and had great spent all, spent all she had and nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard that Jesus came and pressed behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. So her heart was there with, with Jesus. She knew that Jesus was the plague and Jesus immediately knew himself that the virtue had gone out of him turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and saith thou, how, Who touched me? And he looked around and, and about to see her, he had done this thing. But the woman, fearing, trembling, knowing what she had done to her, came and fell down before him, said to her daughter, Your faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole in thy plague. So today, we should have that burning in our hearts. Always. It should be a consuming fire. It should, it should make us strong towards God. When we come to church, we come to church to hear, hear the word of God. We come to communion and we say, thank you for dying for us on the cross and giving us new life. We ask this always in your blessed and glorious name, Lord. Amen.
Good morning again. You know, I find it really interesting. Dave and I didn't talk about any thing that we were going to be sharing today when he was planning communion and I was planning this sermon, but funny enough, the way the Holy Spirit seems to work is things connect because I will be talking about the purity of heart. I I wanted to present a a short story um, presented from the newspaper, The Sword of the Lord, which once explained that a minister whose heart was aglow with ministry zeal gave notice to his congregation that in the evening an offering would be taken for missions. And he asked for liberal gifts said, you are going to kill the church if you go on saying give, give, give. No church can stand it. You are going to kill it. Well, after the sermon, the preacher said to the people, Brother Jones told me I am going to kill this church if I keep asking you to give. But my brethren, churches don't die that way. If anybody knows, I would be very much obligated if my brother would tell me where that church is. For if I visit it and climb on the walls of that church under the light of the moon and say, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. If you haven't guessed it by now, we're going to be talking about a touchy topic of giving to the Lord. I don't know why it's touchy, but, you know, great, here it comes. The preacher is going to relentlessly grill us in order that we will give, give, give to the church. I want to just put you all at ease right now and let you know that is not my intention, and that is not the point of this sermon. The point of this sermon is much deeper and more profound in concept, and it is fully regarded regarding and focused around our hearts into one of the most significant yet most feared sections of the entire book of Acts. You see, all too often many of us, especially many teachers and preachers of the truth, they they tend to want to be tempted to gloss over this section because it first focuses on the topic of giving, which many of us as people don't like to be confronted with, but also, and much more importantly, because we are introduced to a characteristic that displays the seriousness of trying to manipulate and pull the wool over God's eyes. In today's text, we will be introduced to the concept of a beautiful, pure, and honest form of giving versus an ugly, dishonest, and impure form of giving. And through the two examples given today, we will come to understand that we need to live a life that is driven by, once said, and I I fully agree with him, that it's not persecution that destroys the church, only insecurity and hypocrisy from the inside destroys the church. You see, the, the church is at its weakest when people the people who make it up aren't truly wanting to follow God. Instead, they are focused on serving their own selfish wants and desires, willing to do exactly what we see trying to take place within the early church. The actions of a select few individuals threaten to destroy the church from the inside out. So will you please open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 4. We will be starting right where we left off last week, picking up in verse 32. And as you find your text, our text for the day, I offer this challenge to each and every one of us who make up heaven's allegiance really lies. Ask yourself the question, are, is my heart fully devoted to Christ or myself? So with that being said, we're going to be starting in verse 32 of chapter 4. Four, and 
we see that God's word reads, and the song to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or house would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need, desire to give. See, here again, just like as we saw in Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47, we are given another little snapshot of the health and well-being of the, the church as a whole. We see in verse 33 that the apostles were boldly continuing to teach and testify to the resurrection of Jesus. And because of this, God was pouring out an abundance of grace upon all within the church. Faith within the believers of the church. Due to the persecution of the church and their desire to endure and follow God faithfully, regardless of the harm that may come upon them by the Jewish religious leaders, because remember back in the first part of chapter 4, persecution had started to begin by the Jewish religious leaders. We see that the church grew closer and closer together through this, the church so in love with Jesus, they are so connected, they are like family. As the bride of Christ, the people were all in sync with one another. They were living life with the same heart, the same soul, meaning they were all pursuing Christ as one and with the same pure intentions. I wonder... Can we hear as the early church was? By the way, that's just some kindly food for thought to chew on as we move forward. For you see, the things taking place here in, in the early church are rooted in the supernatural spiritual transformation taking place within the people their hearts, and everything they have. With this being said, if we step back just a little and look at verses 32 through 35 as a whole, we are introduced to one of the deep desires that is now flowing through the people. You see, because of the persecution that was beginning to come upon the church, many people were affected. Many of the people within the church most likely lost jobs, not locals to Jerusalem, but who had decided to stay in Jerusalem as a part of the church after the day of Pentecost happened that were still in need. Luke is showing us this beautiful image of how the church lived and functioned. They lovingly supported each other because their ever-growing family was hurting and in need. Now, you may be thinking that the church was practical truth. You see, communism is the idea of what you have, I should have. Where socialism is the idea that you take funds from the wealthy and redistribute the funds to the masses. Both are involuntary, meaning you have no choice. You must participate, and both are enforced by the authorities and have always failed and led to death, the death of millions. Instead, the church was simply responding to the needs of their fellow brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit had placed such a powerful generosity inside the hearts of the people that their generosity just naturally flowed out from them. At no point here do we read that it was forced. Nobody was demanding and forcibly taking portions from someone else to give to another. Instead, what you see is desire to love each other. Haven't we heard something similar to that? What sums up the prophets, the, the, pro, the law and the prophets? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. 
That's what the church is doing right here. They love Christ so much that they can't help but love others. And as needs arose, they didn't hesitate to jump on the opportunity to give, even if that meant selling property or other goods to make it happen. The church was driven with the desire to give. And that desire flowed out of a pure heart of love that they had not only for Christ, but for each other as a family as well. W.B. Knight once told the story of a young boy who worked in a factory, a lesson, which received him a less than encouraging remark from his teacher. You can't sing. You want to know how to destroy a 10-year-old's dreams? There you go. You can't sing. You haven't any voice at all, said the teacher. Your voice sounds like a a wind in the shutters. See, it gets even worse. He could learn to sing. She was very, very poor, but she hugged him and said, my boy, I am going to make every sacrifice to pay for your vocal lessons. Her encouragement and sacrifice for her son proved to be invaluable. He became known as one of the world's greatest singers. His name is Enrico Caruso, who was the most admired Italian opera tenor in the early church. The early church desired to give each other, to give to each other, just like the mother in the story did. It didn't matter about the cost. She was willing to sacrifice and give. Her heart was filled with generosity towards her son, When you love others as Christ does, generosity is the response that will flow from your heart. Jesus loves us so much that he gave his life to to purchase us out of the body. As the church, we should desire and strive to be just as generous. The nature to be a generous person comes from having a pure heart filled by the transforming spirit of Christ. That's why when we give, it should always be driven by a pure heart. Continuing on with Luke's snapshot of the church, we are then told of two powerful stories to evaluate. The first story begins in verse 36. It says, Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprin, how how do you say that? Did I say it right? Cyprian birth, who was called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought it free. And though this beautiful story is quite short, nonetheless, there is a powerful lesson that we can learn. The second key point for today is that a pure heart honors God. We are now introduced to a man named Joseph, like, or Luke quickly tells us that Joseph was a Levite whose hometown was, in, on, was the island of Cyprian. Luke is then quick to let us know that Joseph, a man by the name Barnabas, which, as Luke tells us, translated to meaning the son of encouragement. This is a powerful truth regarding the character of Barnabas. And Luke does not want us to miss it. We learn from Clement of Alexandria's writings that Barnabas was in fact one of the 70 sent out by Jesus. He was a truly devoted man of God who most definitely lived up to the nickname he was in Acts chapter 10 in which we see him encouraging Saul who would later become Paul. He also encourages his nephew Mark during a time of doubt and fear. We will later learn that he also encourages the church of Antioch as one of its key teachers and leaders. Barnabas, in his very nature, was a man who Christ used to bring great encouragement to others. And here in Acts chapter 4, we see him being... You see, Barnabas just so happened to be blessed enough in life that he, he owned an extra plot of land. However, what exactly that property was or was used for, it doesn't matter in this story. 
Otherwise, we would have been given the details. But we know he was blessed enough to have an extra plot of land, but it was what Barnabas chooses to do with it that is important. You see, Barnabas was, he being filled with love and compassion for his fellow brothers and sisters, decides that he is going to sell this property that he has. Luke is using this story of Barnabas to serve as an example of generosity that was driving the people. We read that Barnabas sold the land and took all the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, you got to understand, this was a common practice during the, as the person brings funds and lays it at the feet of another, such as Barnabas does here. He was also declaring that all the rights he had to the possessions, in this case it was money, is now relinquished. No strings are attached, no expectation of praise. He just gives it all over to the apostles to be used as they see fit. Barnabas is showing us the purity in his heart. He, this is a beautiful, pure form of giving. This is the type of giving that honors Christ. Barnabas just wants to love others like Jesus did. And through that process, he most certainly brings a smile to the Lord's face. We today should have the same heartfelt attitude when it comes to giving and helping others. Or instead, do we give because we love Christ and others and just want to take care of people? Again, here's some more food for thought to chew on as we continue in this sermon. For you see, it's, it's not the amount of money Barnabas was willing to give that truly matters. That doesn't matter. But it's his heart behind. Give, it should always be driven by a pure heart. What a beautiful example for us to see within the church. And what a beautiful example for us to desire within our own lives. However, the story doesn't just stop there. Luke continues in order to show us a different side of the same coin. Picking up in chapter 5, starting in verse 1, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it down at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this? Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young, woman, er, the young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that the Lord to the test. Behold, the feet of those whom have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. The young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out, buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Here we're introduced to another story of giving. Key point for today is that an impure heart dishonors God. This is the story in which many Christians today get very uncomfortable with. And the reason that is, is because it challenges some of our preconceived notions of Christ and what, what we have thought about him. Many people look at this story and say, well, that's not the Jesus I know. The Jesus punishment didn't match the crime. But that's where we must stop. We must stop and evaluate our own hearts 
and evaluate why this truth of Christ's nature makes us so uncomfortable. You see, with responses like these, we are beginning to get in dangerous water ourselves. Yes, he is all loving. And yes, he is willing to forgive all of our sins. He is also an all-powerful, completely holy, righteous, and just God. And when he chooses to judge, we can be certain that it was done fairly and according to his holy and righteous nature. Meaning, we as his people, especially if our judgment of him, our judgments of him are placing him in a box of our own creation. Because we love to do that. Instead, we must embrace God for who exactly he is. And for who he has revealed himself to be to us. And we need to be willing to change our that's so often we need to understand that we, like when we read scripture, it's not, well, I don't like that God, do it my way, I'll go this way. It's no, the scripture says do this, I'm obviously not doing this, maybe I should do this. That's the idea. I change, God doesn't change. With the, that fact being example, in verses 1 through 2, we're introduced to our characters, Ananias along with his wife, Sapphira, who, like Barnabas, owned some land. They decided to sell the property. However, here, a different dynamic comes up. The scripture tells us that they both had decided to keep a portion of the proceeds, which hear me clearly now. This is not wrong for them to do. These two people had decided, well, we want to keep some of the proceeds and then we will give the rest to the Lord. That would have been just as beautiful and pure of a gift from the heart as any. In which God would have honored what they gave and used it for great things. But in verse 2, we see that they took the remainder of the money and laid it at the apostles' feet cementing the legal contract to the Lord that all the proceeds given are now to be used for his purpose. No problem at all. It'd be just like Barnabas' story. The gift would look and be just like the one Barnabas gave, showing us their pure and sincere generosity for the Lord's people. However, it doesn't end here, sadly. No, we see that God's not fooled by the impurity of heart directing the motives behind the gifts. And verses, but with Satan has lied, and he's questioned by Peter. It is interesting to note that this is the first time that we see Satan directly shown since the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We, we've seen him working in the background through the religious leaders but this is the first time that he's brought up in Acts, where it's his name directly being pointed to this church by corrupting the hearts of these two individuals. Satan saw that persecution didn't work on the church. So now he has regrouped and is trying a new and dangerous method. He hopes to corrupt the church from the inside out. Ananias and Sapphira have aligned with the enemy, and the two had decided to lie to God. They had told the apostles that this was all the proceeds. The fact that they held back money isn't the problem. The fact that they lied about it to receive praise for themselves is. These two have directly dishonored the Lord with the impurity of their hearts. That is the crime they are guilty of. They intentional with trying to have the church function according to the ways of the world. 
the ways of the world, lying, stealing, cheating. That's what would have eventually continued to come. They would rather the church function according to corruption and greed instead of love and generosity. But Jesus is not going to allow Satan and his pawns to get away with that easily. So we see that judgment comes upon Ananias and he falls down dead in his tracks. Three hours later, without any knowledge of her husband's fate, Sapphira comes in, in which she is asked by Peter, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. The, the Lord here and through her men to stick to her lie and without blinking an eye, she responds, yes, that was the price. So because she was unwilling to repent, because she was devoted to testing the Lord, we see that yet again judgment comes. And Sapphira, just like her husband, falls down dead. Impure hearts dishonor God. And it's a serious act. Especially when it's coming from the inside of the church. These two individuals decided to try and pull the wool over the Lord's eyes. You know, the very Lord that says, I see all things. But our all-knowing God, you have to understand, can be a raging wildfire. And when someone try, evil tries to test him, it is only a matter of time before they get burned and have to deal with his holy and righteous judgment. And those words are important to remember because God is holy, he is righteous, so his judgment is right. But we get uncomfortable when we see something this drastic coming from God. But there's very good reasons that this happens. That is who God is. And he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He didn't stand for the corruption of sin that brought death and destruction upon mankind in the Garden of Eden, did he? No, he sent Jesus, his one and only begotten son, to deal with it. And he will not stand for the corruption that mess around. But all too often, we want to mess around with God. And not in a good way of going, I'm going out to do your will. It's, I'm going to challenge you every step of the way. But God doesn't mess around, especially when his people are being treated so poorly. And you might be going, but persecution's been happening all around. Guess what? Have you read Revelation? It doesn't say he's coming back on a donkey. It doesn't say he's coming back with peace. He's coming for war on a war horse. And those behind him, the saints, they're on war horses too. But they don't do anything. They just get to watch the Lord take care of business. God doesn't mess around, especially when his people are being threatened. The ten plagues, we forget the God, what's that 10th plague? Every firstborn is going to die unless they have the blood of the lamb put over their doorpost, and he held true to that. Many like to say, well, that, that was the angel of death. We, we always try to pull it off. Later, later it says, God did this. He takes credit. This is the early church just for me. He has to do something. He has to act drastically. He has to nip it in the bud so quickly so that the rest of the church will go, okay, I'm not going to do that. And we see that in the scripture. People start having a healthy fear of what's going on, of what it means to be a Christian in the church. I mean, we're told to fear the Lord and his rule, his authority, his laws, his way, 
the church should function. The punishment most certainly does match the crime. And if you want to disagree with me, I'll argue all day long with you about it. Because God's a holy and righteous judge, and when he judges, he's right. Of impurity and the lies of Satan. Instead, his church was to be built off of the truth and love of Christ, our blessed Savior. His church was to be filled with people who allow him to make us pure of heart. So, what do we do with this lesson revealed to us by Luke? That's the real question. He seems to think that it was quite important for us to understand people like Ananias and Sapphira. They were the type of people who appear to have a strong spiritual life, but were just pretending to love Christ and his people. They were the type of people to stay, say they follow Christ but are not really committed to him. They were the type of people who only come to church to be served but never willing to serve others. They were the type of people who want to be honored by men more than they want to bring honor. So we all, my brothers and sisters, must be honest, not only with ourselves but with the Lord as well. Now's the time to take a good, deep, hard look at your own heart and ask, do you practice spiritual deceit? Do you pretend to follow Christ while at church, but while at home you live a completely different life? Just think on that for a minute. Because you see, we are given the opportunity to evaluate who we are before a holy and righteous God today. And if you find that your life has fallen short, indeed you are guilty of acting in any of these negative ways, don't worry. I encourage you to bring any guilt that you have, any sin you are guilty of before the Lord. Repent, and let his saving grace flow over you and through you. He will transform you, and he will reshape your heart. All you must do is love him, trust him, and allow him to do the rest. Jesus is in the is driven by a pure heart. Will you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this section of Scripture and Acts because even though it deals with some difficult issues and really challenges us to, to look at ourselves and our relationship with you, we, we see and understand that you are giving up for you and allow you to create in us this pure heart that like the early church, like Barnabas, like the apostles, was focused on loving you first and others. Help us to be people like that, to be people of encouragement. And if we happen to evaluate ourselves, Lord, and we find that, that we have to turn from those ways, to give our sin up, and let you forgive us and transform our hearts and transform our lives. We love you, Jesus, and we pray all this in your holy name. Amen. So at this time, the praise team is going to start making their way forward. And my conclusion really did ask the questions, that those who are already in the church and those who aren't. So if you happen to be here and you're not a part of the church and you would like to be, you are welcome to come forward as we sing this song. Uh, you can sit right up front here. I'd love to chat with you a little bit afterwards, and we can move on to the next stage, which is filling up the baptismal behind me. But if you are in the church, that conclusion that I gave is what we 
If we're not, you don't have to come forward. Right where you stand, repent and allow him to heal you. Will you please stand as we sing this song? Share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there. Go away. But just like you promised, you came here to stay. I just had to pray. And you just said, Come to the wall. You may all be seated. We have a little bit of trivia here. How long was the ark? 150 cubits. Uh, <laughs> cubits? 300 cubits or 450 to 510 feet, depending on how that cubic was <laughs> measured. <laughs> what was the total number of the children of Israel that went down to Egypt? This is a good one. Forty-nine? Seventy. On what three occasions are we expressly told that Jesus wept? Lazarus died? In the garden? When he was looking at Jerusalem. At the grave of Lazarus, over Jerusalem, and in Gethsemane. What is the whole duty of man according to the scriptures? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And love the Lord your God. That's why Jesus summed up everything with that. <laughs> Praise and prayers. I have a couple here. Um, we need to be praying for Larry Lindsay. Did I say that right? Larry Lindsay and the family. Um, Larry, he's at home and they don't expect him to live much longer. And he's kind of the pillar of their, their family. So Anne Murray's father. Yeah, just so that everybody knows and is connecting dots with, with who we're talking about. Um, also, this was one that... I didn't get to last week. It was given to me afterwards um, from Mary Kay. I don't know who it's from, but it says, Dear Church, please pray for the children in our community, not just once, but all the time. There's a lot going on in our small community that we are unaware of. Belief in God has been ridiculed and avoided by families and generations. Pray our kids will be hungry for the true word of our Lord. Pray we, oursel we ourselves will be loving examples of Christ. So, which that is a very good prayer request. 
anything else women's retreat they're coming back today so yep definitely prayers for safe travels there quentin I pray for carmelita and her, prayers for Carm she's having an allergy attack so. yeah, carmelita is having some type of an allergy attack she's really not um feeling well so prayers for healing um i wanted to say last week i have appraised my my friend in lone rock that had a, a bad stroke in april is doing really well but they told her the CT scan, and there are none. She was misdiagnosed. Oh, that is, so praise the Lord. That is definitely a praise. That's good news. That is good news. Well, let's, mm -hmm. let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just the fact that we get to come before you. And bring our prayers and petitions, Lord. I, it's not going to be the easiest thing for the family to deal with. And so I pray, Lord, that you would bring them grace, or your grace, your comfort, your security, your strength through this. Father, I also want to pray for Carmelita. And the fact that she's struggling with allergies so bad to the point that it, she, it hurts to breathe on both sides of her um, chest and and that's not a good place to be the children here in Morrow County it seems like there's some things that we're not all necessarily aware of that is affecting them and drawing them further and further away from you Lord so we want to pray that you would first and foremost open up their hearts and give them a drive and a love and a desire to want to know you and we also pray, Lord, that we will be, as your bride, children can see you through us. Father, we just thank you so much for everything you have given. And we, we do praise you for the fact that um, Candy's friend is doing much better. And we do even praise you for the fact that there was a misdiagnosis and she doesn't have the tumors that she thought she had. Lord, I just ask, live our lives fully submitted to you in every aspect. Help us to shine brightly out in this dark and lost world so that others can see you and be drawn to you, Lord. It's in your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, will you please stand for this final song? our service. Thank you. Have a great week. Have a good week.